you at this time. Raise your hand if you did not get a red marker today, the 9th of October. Are we good? Let's go ahead and take a look at generating the equation of a line that contains two points. And so our tool, right, our tool that we developed last class to write the equation of a line that contains two points that's more efficient than our old friend slope intercept form is our new friend on the block, and that is point slope form. And so point slope form is going to be the most efficient way to generate the equation of a line that contains two points, as so long as one of those points isn't the y-intercept. If one of the points were the y-intercept, like 0, 0,7 or 0, comma b, right, then the most efficient way would be slope intercept form to generate the equation. But in most cases, we're given two points where one of them is not that special y-intercept. So point slope form is our go-to. I'm going to call on you to share with the class the point slope form with just letters in a minute. So please be ready. So what's point slope form with just letters? What does that look like? Uh, Olivia B? Um, y minus 4 Excellent, thank you. Where this m is still the same old slope that we can calculate, right, by using our rise over run formula and the two points. And this x sub 1 comma y sub 1 is just one of the points. It doesn't matter which one. Both of them will satisfy the linear equation because both of them are on the line. All right, so let's go ahead and do our slope calculation. So we'll start out with m equals. And we'll use our age old slope formula back from algebra 1. It looks like y sub 2 minus y sub 1 all over x sub 2 minus x sub 1. And I'm getting a minus a negative is plus a positive, so it looks like negative 2 sixths, which in turn is negative 1 third. At this time, check out your bellwork paper. Raise your hand if you have negative 1 third already. Negative 1 third? Yes, good job. So now we're going to take that value, negative 1 third, and we're going to plug it into my equation where I see the m, right? We're going to plug that in where I see the m. At the same time, we'll go ahead and plug in one of my points is x sub 1 comma y sub 1. Go ahead and tell the class what point you'd like to use for x sub 1 comma y sub 1. Katie? Uh, I used to like second pair. The second pair? That I see no negatives, so we won't have to do a rewrite. I would use the second pair as well. Good, let's do it. y minus y sub 1 would be 9 if we use the point. Equals, what am I using for m? Well, the slope we calculated, negative 1 third times parentheses, x minus, and then the x coordinate from the point we selected is 3. Stop. Stick a fork in it, because we're done. Right? That's it. This is the point slope form. This is point slope form of the equation of a line. Now we're going to go ahead and rewrite our final answer in slope intercept form. And so we've gone ahead and did point slope form. Now we'll go ahead and rewrite in slope intercept form. To do that, we're going to solve for y and make it look like y equals mx plus b. So let's go ahead and continue the party. Our final answer then, we could rewrite in slope intercept form by solving for y. So I'll distribute on the right hand side. That will keep my y minus 9. But I'll distribute through the parentheses. Negative 1 third times x is negative 1 third x. Negative times a negative is a positive. And a third of 3 is 1. I'll finish it out, final step, by adding over 9, and I get negative 1 third x plus 10. So negative 1 third x plus 10. Go ahead and raise your hand if you already had that. Did anybody get all the way to the end? Negative 1 third x plus 10 with the negative signs. Way to go, you guys. That's awesome. What questions do you guys have about today's bar? Then I'm going to go ahead and label these boxes so we know which is which. What form, right? What form is the red box in? What form is that red box in, Adam? Point slope. Good. So this is point slope form. And what form is this green box final answer in? What form is that in, Casey? Um, slope intercept. Thank you. And now we're going to save those definitely PDFable notes. So we want PDFable so we can save those bad boys. Great. Let's take a look at the second one. Well, we always want to make sure that we're connecting the linear equation concepts we're developing in class back to a real world context, right? Complete with units. And so we'll have to be able to interpret uh, linear relationships even when they involve a graph and we're not given an equation specifically. Refer to the graph at right. Mort walked to the library where he studied for a while and then walked home. How long did Mort stay at the library? This is all about graphing, right? Interpreting the graph and units. And so as I look at this, this graph, which portion of the graph, which piece, if you will, represents his stay at the library. Margo? 
The flat one at the top. The flat one at the top. So this segment right here in green represents his stay at the library. So to determine the length of his stay in hours, we can go ahead and go down to the x-axis, in this case the time t in hours, or h-axis, bless you. And we'll go ahead and figure out how far it was from this x-coordinate to this x-coordinate. And it appears as though we're going by 1, 2, 3, 4, fifths of an hour, and so it looks like we've gone one, two, three, four, five fifths of an hour, so it appears as though we stayed there for one hour, because I would tell you are getting one hour, 60 minutes. Awesome. So let's go ahead and say one hour is how long we stayed, and I got that by considering my, my x-axis, or in this case, my h-axis for time in hours. Next, find more speed in blocks per hour on his way to the library. Blocks per hour Blocks per hour, and so we have got speed in general is given by my change in distance over change in time. So speed, we could think of a change in distance over change in time. Oftentimes this little triangle is used to represent change, the change in a quantity. So the change in distance over change in time. And as I look at that first line segment in red, on his way to the library, would go from the point zero, zero to the point one, two, three, three-fifths of an hour, three-fifths of an hour to get 12 blocks. So let's go ahead and see how that's going to work out. So our change in distance was a total of, a total of 12 blocks divided by our change in time was one, two, three out of five tick marks, so three-fifths of an hour. So three-fifths of an hour was my change in time. 12 blocks is my change in distance. Can I make this look a little bit better, a speed in blocks per hour? Certainly. I know that to divide fractions, right, I multiply by the reciprocal. That is, division is the same as multiplication by the reciprocal. So 12 divided by 3 fifths is the same as 12 times 5 over 3. I'll slap this bad boy over 1, and we'll go ahead and multiply straight across or reduce first either way, we'll get the same thing. So I get 60 divided by 3 is 20, or alternatively I can do 12 divided by 3 is 4 times the 5 on top is 20. Where are the units on this 20 going to be? Right? What are the units on this 20 going to be? Braden? Blocks per hour. Awesome, blocks per hour. So it looks like we're at 20 blocks per hour. Thank you. And lastly, find the total distance that Mort walked. So we went to the library. How far away was the library from his home? 12. And then he walked home. So even though the speed of his, of his walk home was different than his speed uh, uh, to the library, he still went the same distance to get back home 12 blocks. So it looks like a grand total of 24 blocks. All right, 24 blocks. I'll raise your hand if you already had that. So 24 blocks. Great. Thanks, hands down. What questions do you guys have about today's bell work question? Okay, then let's take care of our homework. There are no reading questions in assignment number two. So our maximum infinite campus score is four. To get your infinite campus score, go ahead and give yourself credit for those you completed in pencil out of 19. Divide, enter, multiply by four, and let's round our infinite campus score to the nearest half point zero four. Nobody should have a five for today's infinite campus score because there are no reading questions associated with today's assignment. So four is your max for today. At the same time, please make sure that you've got your name, 1A, and number 2 clearly labeled for your heading on the top right of your assignment. And go ahead and staple multiple pages together. If you have multiple pages, go ahead and take this opportunity to staple them now. We'll begin checking, and I'll put a staple on the front table as well as that side activity table. There's a stapler. What questions do you have about your infinite campus score today? All right, so let's go ahead and put pencils down, please. Pencils down. And let's check our assignment with our grading pens. Our grading pens.
can soon we'll be advancing, so please make sure you're checking. Fine to leave your equations in point slope form, right? Unless it specifies otherwise. On your test, you should be able to do either. Like kind of like a bell work, number one. You should be able to generate the equation in point slope form is the most efficient method. And then if the answer asks you, I'm sorry, if the directions ask you to report your final answer in slope intercept form, you should be comfortable doing that as well. And we'll be advancing this soon. And you should be using your graph and calculators anytime they ask you to find a regression line. You should be using your graph and calculator command, stat, calc, linear regression, and how to be entered to generate the equation. slide we've all been looking for. As you're finishing up, go ahead and give yourself an accuracy fraction out of how many you did, about how many did you get right, and circle that in pen. Make sure your infinite canvas score is box, nice and big in pencil at the top. Final check that your heading, name first and last, 1A, number two, clear label, and then pass from the back to the front, please. Front rowers, if you make sure they're facing the same direction, I appreciate your help. Number two, number two. Awesome. Okay, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm super excited about today. Uh, so, why is slope intercept form useful? Right? Why is slope intercept form useful? So what I want you to do is go ahead and share with the class what does slope intercept form look like with letters? And then we'll go ahead and 
say why it's useful. So what does slope-intercept form look like with letters? Marina? Which one is that? That's correct. Good. So y equals mx plus b, thank you, is slope-intercept form. And this is good for a couple things. One thing that slope-intercept form is good for is it's easy to make a graph by hand. You can just plot the y-intercept, the b-value on the y-axis, and then count out your slope numbers to fractionize the run to get additional points. So it's easy to graph in slope-intercept forms. And um, also good for modeling initial value problems. When you know that start value, that initial value on the, on the y-axis, then you can model initial value problems. Go ahead and tell the class what standard form looks like with letters. So what does standard form, what does standard form look like with letters? Tyler? Uh, y minus y sub 1. Or, no. no, that's not so. Uh, Ax plus y. Thank you. That's exactly right. So Ax plus by equals c, where a, b, and c are integers and A is positive, that's standard form. Why is that useful? Well, standard form, it makes it easy to find my intercepts and make a quick graph just using my intercepts. So easy to find intercepts when standard form. Or model linear combination situations. Our linear combination situations are when we're combining two or more things for some predetermined whole, like the number of student ticket sales plus adult ticket sales equals your total revenue for the for the show, stuff like that. So linear combinations, right, can be modeled with standard form. And lastly, point slope form, right? What does point slope form look like with with letters. Mark? Um, y minus y sub 1 equals m parenthesis x minus x sub 1. Excellent. I want you to think about why that form is useful. Why do we have a third form? Meridian. So what do we use point slope form? Go ahead and tell the class what I'm calling you. What was point slope form useful for? What do we do with that form? Margo? Um, when we don't have a y-intercept, but we have a point slope Absolutely. Absolutely. So if we don't, if we're not given the y-intercept, but we're given two other points, then point slope form is the easiest way to find that line's equation. Good. Thank you. And so this is best for finding equations of lines when given two points, or the point in a slope. best for finding the linear equations if we're not given the initial condition, or not given the start value. <laughs> so who cares? Well, the real power of algebra is when those variables in our equation have meaning, when they represent real life quantities. So today what we're going to do is we're going to let x and y stand for real life quantities in a variety of different physical situations. And we're going to generate linear models and interpret them to answer some real life questions. So that's what we're going to be doing today. The real power of algebra is when those variables represent real life quantities complete with units. So let's go ahead and take a look at our creating and interpreting linear models packet. So everybody find your packet. Today we're going to do two of these problems in full together. Then you're going to have an opportunity to work with your partner to complete the remaining three. 3F, 4F, and 5F are going to end up being stamped eligible items, okay? We're going to practice two of these together so you have nice examples of how you can attack them. Then you're going to spend some time talking with your partner, all right, and interpreting the linear models in the remaining three to earn stamps during today's class period. We're also going to start your homework. So your homework is the scatter plot worksheet. That includes four different data sets that you're going to use your graphing calculator to generate models for. So you can make the graph and perform the linear regression using the stat menu and commands on your graphing calculator. We're going to do the first one together so you'll just have three problems for homework. 
So all in all, on your own, you'll be charged with the task of doing three stamp problems and then three homework problems. So you're really just going to have six problems on your own, but all of them are real world quantities and real world problem situations. So I'm super excited about that. Margo. Like, you give us these graphs here. If we do it in our calculator, do we have to use them? For the scatter clock worksheet, no. You don't have to use those graphs if we're you do it. Using these ones? But we are using for the creating and interpreting, right? This first one we're doing by hand. So the first one. Correct. So that's a great question. Everybody listen. So the creating and interpreting linear models, the pocket we're doing together first, we're doing by hand, right? We're doing those by hand and practicing with point slope form. Then the, the scatter plots worksheet we're doing with the calculator. Cool? Okay. Let's go ahead and get going then. The number of dollars per month that costs you to own a car is a linear function of the number of miles per month you drive. If you drive 300 miles per month, the cost is $500. If you drive 900 miles, the cost is $700 per month. Let's go ahead and choose variables x and y to represent the independent variable value quantity and the dependent variable quantity. In order to do this, you've got to decide what quantity depends on which. And so I like to make a little sentence in my head. So I'm thinking out loud right now, and I'm thinking, hmm, does my number of dollars per month it costs to own a car depend on the number of miles I drive it? Or does the number of miles I drive the car depend on the number of dollars it costs me to own it? So I'm trying to make, which one makes most sense in your head? So do you think the cost of owning the car depends on how many miles I drive it? Or the number of miles I drive the car depends on the cost of owning my car? Or which do you think depends on which? All right, Logan and Barrett, what do you guys think? Um, I said that the cost depends on the amount of miles you drive. Absolutely. So cost would be the dependent variable in this case, and that's always the y value. So let's go ahead and let y equal the cost in dollars of owning the car. The cost in dollars of owning the car per month. Then x would be the number of miles that we drive. In this way, we can now pick out two points. So if I let x be my miles driven and y be my cost in dollars, then the given information will give me two points. It appears as though if I drive 300 miles per hour, per, sorry, per month, the cost is $500. That's the point. So 300 miles is paired with $500, the cost. What other point would be on this linear relationship? Go ahead and tell the class when I call on you. So based on given information, what other point would be on this linear relationship? Jackson? Um, Good. Everybody make sure that your X and Y's are matching. So those were miles for the X coordinate. 900 miles? Yes, it is. These were dollars, cost per month for owning the car in the Y coordinate. Are the 500 cost in dollars? Yes. Is the 700 cost in dollars? Yes. So we want to make sure that our variables are matching. Now I can find the slope of my line, and we'll do that using my age-old slope formula, just from Bellwork. So we'll go ahead and do m equals y sub 2 minus y sub 1 all over x sub 2 minus x sub 1. I'm getting 700 minus 500 is 200. over 900 minus 300 is 600. And remember that these are, right, these are dollar numbers, these are cost numbers in dollars, and these are miles driven. So when we go ahead and get our answer, I'm going to get 1 over 3. And think about the units here. My units would be y units over x units, because my y variable were the numbers on top, and my x variable were the numbers on bottom. So this would be dollars per mile. You see that? So it looks like as the number of miles I drive my car increases, my cost for owning the car is increasing at a rate of a third of a dollar for every mile I drive. Now I'll go ahead and interpret what the slope represents. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and write what the slope represents. In order to do this, we can use a template. Right? If we want to, if we need a template, we won't use this every single time, but it will give us a good, a good start if we ever get stuck. So to tell what the slope represents, it's always 
how quickly the y quantity is increasing or decreasing with respect to the x quantity. As the x quantity increases, we want to see what's happening to the y quantity. So a good template, and you don't have to use this, but I'm just saying a good template that would get you full credit on your interpreting for your day four quiz would be the y quantity is increasing or decreasing at a rate of slope number y units per x unit. What? The y quantity is increasing or decreasing at a rate of the slope number y units per x unit. Let's think about that in our miles driven versus, versus cost of owning my car problem. Ready? The cost of owning the car is increasing at a rate of one-third dollars per mile driven. That makes sense. If I drive my car more, the cost of money is going to go up. How much? Well, it's going up a third of a dollar for every mile that I drive that car. Let's go ahead and write that down. Then. So for my go-go gadget arm, the cost of owning the car is increasing because it was a positive slope at a rate of one-third of a dollar per mile driven. So a third of a dollar increase for every mile more that I drive the car. Let's go ahead and write an equation and express my cost in dollars in terms of my miles driven. So we already have our slope Right? And we already have our points, so our go-to our go -to form would be point to a form. So we can start out with my y minus y sub 1 equals m times quantity x minus x sub 1. We already saw that my slope m, my slope m was the one-third. Which point would you like to use? Well, I'll use the smaller numbers in this case. So y minus y1. I'll use the 300 comma 500 point to generate my equation. So y minus 500 equals one third times quantity x minus 300. Is that right? 300 miles comma 500 dollars. Good. This is point slope form. I'll go ahead and solve for y to practice. So my y minus 500 equals one third x minus 100, which means that y equals one third x minus 100 plus 500 to be plus 400. Let's go ahead and graph and label our axes. So we'll go ahead and graph and label our axes now. So we'll graph and label our axes. What was our dependent variable value? When we had y, our y-axis is cost in dollars. So let's go ahead and label that everyone, please. Cost in dollars. Versus our miles driven was on our x-axis. Our two data points included 300, 500, and 900, 700. So we want to make sure that we encapsulate our data points. So when I figure out my scale, I'll go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So it looks like we go by hundreds of dollars, right? Hundreds of dollars. So I'll go ahead and go 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 dollars. I'm sorry. Yep, 500 dollars. And my miles driven, I went up to 900 miles driven. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So let's go by hundreds. You guys want to go by hundreds? So one, two, three, four, five hundred miles driven. Six, seven, eight, nine, a thousand miles driven. Everybody, let's make a nice graph now of our line. I know that the two points on my line, given information, Margo. Can you have 10 on both sides? Can we do 100? You have 10 on both sides? Yeah. That's fine. Good. I just wanted to make sure that it fit when I was making the, the notes up here nicely. I think it does. So we've got 300 comma 500. Everybody plot it. 300 comma 500. We've got 900 comma 700. Everybody plot it. 
and I can even see my y-intercept. My y-intercept and slope-intercept form was 400, 0, 400. So it should match out if I included that as well. Next, we'll go ahead and find that y-intercept, right, and the x-intercept. So my y-intercept, my y-intercept is the value of the y-quantity when x equals 0. My x-intercept is the value of the x-quantity when my y-quantity is 0. Let's go ahead and find those now. So my y-intercept, I can start with my equation, y equals 1 third x plus 400. When x is 0, y is 400. So I get that one for free if I'm in slope-intercept form. So my y-intercept is 0. 400. My x-intercept, I'll have to do a little work. My x-intercept will be given by y equals 1 third x plus 400. I need to plug in 0 for y and solve. So I'll plug in 0 for y and solve for x. So I'll subtract over the 400. And I'll multiply both sides by 3. <coughs> Bless you. So I get x equals negative 1,200. I'm going to go ahead and write that as a point, however. Negative 1,200, comma, 0. Bye, y'all. negative 1200 comma 0. As I look at my graph, right, as I look at my graph, where would negative 1200 comma 0 be? Well, it would be way over here, so that looks right, but can I have a negative number of miles driven? No, and so in the context of this problem, my x-intercept, though correct, doesn't make sense because I can't drive back. But if we think about it, it does kind of make sense because my y-intercept here is positive, that is, when no miles are driven, it still costs me $400 a month to own that car, right? That actually makes sense in the real world situation too, because you've got those costs like car payments, insurance, right? Irregular uh, registration, stuff like that, that you have to pay whether you drive your car or not. So when zero miles are driven, there's still a cost. That'll be part of our interpretation. So what does the y-intercept represent? Again, we could use a template. You do not have to use the template, which is very useful. So the y-intercept value, y-units, is the y-quantity when the x-quantity is 0. That's what it means to be a y-intercept. When the x-quantity is 0, what is the value of the y-quantity? Let's go ahead and interpret that then. So it looks like $400 $400 is the cost of owning the car. When the number of miles driven is Zero. So four hundred dollars is the cost of owning the car when the miles driven is zero. What does the x-intercept represent? Well, in general, the x-intercept then is the x value when y is zero. So x-intercept value x units is the x quantity when the y quantity is zero. You do not have to use this template, but it's a good starter, right, if you get stuck in terms of interpreting the x-intercept or the y-intercept. Let's go ahead and apply that then. So what does the x-intercept represent? Let's find it. it. Looks like negative 1,200. So negative 1,200 miles would be the miles driven. In order for 
for the cost of owning the car to be zero. In other words, we have to drive a negative 1,200 miles in order for my cost to be zero. Can we do that? No, we can't drive a negative number of miles. It's not going to keep bringing that cost down. This makes sense, though, because just for, just for owning the car and not driving at all, you've got to pay $400 a month. And that could come from a variety of things like oil changes, maintenance fees, car insurance, car payments, registration, all that stuff. Awesome. What questions do you have on our first cost of owning a car problem? Great. And let's go ahead and do one more together. We'll get you going on your scatter plots, and you'll have the rest of the time then to work with the partner. So here we go. Linear function gas tank problem. The number of gallons left in the tank varies linearly with the number of miles you have driven. After 40 miles of driving, the tank contains 14 gallons of gas. And after 100 miles, the tank contains 11 gallons. Great. So let's go ahead and pick out our variables then. Let's define our variables. So the number of gallons left in my tank varies linearly with the number of miles you have driven. So a good way to determine my independent and dependent variable, if I'm stuck, is to find my verb. Whatever quantity comes before the verb is typically my y quantity. It depends on, it depends on my independent variable quantity, which comes after my verb. So for us, the number of gallons left in my tank, I'll let that be my y, dependent variable value. That'll depend on, that'll depend on how many miles I've driven. So let y equal the number of gallons in the tank. Then let's let x equal the number of miles that I've driven. So x will equal the number of miles driven. If I let x be the number of miles driven and y be the number of gallons running in my tank, then I can pick out two key points. Go ahead and pick these out with your partner and write them down. Be ready to share with the class. I'm going to call on you what two key points are we given to satisfy this linear relationship in the word problem. Be ready to share when I call on you. <laughs> Okay, what are two points then on my graph? Katie? Um, 40, 14, and 100, but... I'm trying to get the same points as Katie. 40, 14, and 111. Great. Let's go ahead and calculate the slope and tell what it represents in context. So here we go. We can calculate our slope then using our age-old formula. M equals y sub 2 minus y sub 1 all over x sub 2 minus x sub 1. That in turn will equal negative 3 over 100 minus 40 is 60. So it looks like I'm getting negative 1 20th. And I'll go ahead and figure out the units. Remember my units are my y units over my x units for my rate of change unit. My y units were gallons. My x units are miles. Go ahead and tell the class then what this units must be. be. What my y, y units over x units, what must the rate of change units be for this slope number? Ben C. I'm sorry. What must my units then be for this slope, for the slope value, right? If it came from y units over x units in my number. Would that be 20 miles? One yep, so the negative 1 20th would have what on top? All right, what numbers were on top? So 11 and 14, are those x coordinates or y coordinates for my points? And what is y measured in for this problem? Good, so gallons would be my top unit per, and what would my bottom number be measured in? Good. So let's go ahead and interpret my slope number in context. It looks like, right, the number of gallons in my tank is decreasing at a rate of 1 20th of a gallon for every one mile driven. Let's go ahead and write that down. Now. So my for every 20 miles that we drive, we go down one gallon. For every one mile we drive, we go down a 20th of a gallon. So let's tell what that slope number represents in context. So the number of 
gallons in my tank is decreasing because it was a negative at a rate of 1 20th of a gallon per one mile driven. So the number of gallons in my gas tank is decreasing because the slope number is negative at a rate of 1 20th of a gallon for every one mile driven. That makes sense, right? That makes sense. And we think of a lot of cars having gas mileage that's around that, that's around that 20 miles driven for every one gallon used or consumed. Certainly, trucks and SUVs will be less than that miles per gallon. And cars and compact cars will be more than that. But that's certainly a reasonable number. Let's go ahead and write an equation then expressing the gallons of gas remaining in terms of miles driven. So everybody, let's start out with our point slope form. Y minus Y sub 1 equals M times quantity X minus X sub 1. We've calculated our slope. It's negative 1 20th. And we have a point, 40 comma 14. So Y minus 14, X minus 40. And my slope number was negative 1 20th. Let's do it. So here we go. Y minus 14 equals negative 1 20th x negative times a negative is positive and 1 20th times 40 over 1 is 2. So slope intercept form would be y equals negative 1 20th x plus 2 plus 14 is plus 16. So slope intercept form is the box one. Point slope form is the colored one at the top. I'm going to box this one too, just one minute. All right, let's now go ahead and figure out a good scale for us. Now, your graph might be different, right? Your graph might be a little different, but we have our key points 40, 14, and 100, comma 11. So I've got to make sure that I get at least to 14 on my y axis. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Hey, it looks like we can just go by ones. So it looks like we can go by ones there for my gallons in my tank. There's only what? There's only 10. So you're going to have to go above. So you're going to go by twos, or you can go up above it. You can go by twos and get to 20. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so I got 10 in the bottom, so we can go by hundreds. Is that right? Mm. No, by tens, because we just get to 100. Good. So you're going by tens? All right, let's get some key points then. So for us, we've got our 40, 14, 40, 14, and we've got our 100, comma 11. Furthermore, we have a y-intercept that's 0, 16. If we've done this correctly, those should all fall on the line. Let's check. is labeled, we've graphed our line, and we can see as, as number of miles increases, the number of gallons remaining in the tank is decreasing. That makes perfect sense in the context of the problem. All right, let's go ahead and find our y-intercept and interpret it. The y-intercept, if we've got a slope-intercept form, right, is 
for free. We know 0 comma 16 is my y-intercept. So 0 comma 16. I'll write my y equals negative 1 20th x plus 16. So my y-intercept then would be 0 comma 16. In order to find my x-intercept, I have to plug in 0 for y and solve for x. So to find my x-intercept, I need to plug in 0 for y and solve for x. We can do that by subtracting over 16. And then multiplying both sides by the reciprocal. The reciprocal of negative 1 20th is negative 20. So I get negative times negative is positive. 2 times 16 is 32, with the 10 is 320. So I'm getting x equals positive 320. So my x-intercept then will be 320 comma 0. Let's go ahead and interpret those in context. So my y-intercept, right? is the value of y when the x quantity is 0. So when 0 miles are driven, there's 16 gallons in the tank. When 0 miles are driven, there's 16 gallons in the tank. And we could say 16 gallons remain when 0 miles are driven. does the x-intercept represent? So here we have 320 comma 0, right? So go ahead and interpret with your partner then. What does 320 comma 0 have to do with the problem at all? All right. Go ahead and share with the class your interpretation for the x-intercept. Please make reference to each of these numbers, the 320 and the 0 in your description. Brady and Adam, what did you guys say? Oh, you said that when you drive 320 miles in the field, 0. When you drive 320 miles, there's 0 gallons remaining in the tank. Raise your hand if you had a similar interpretation. Great job. Let's go ahead and write it down. Thank you. That's perfect. I bet my tank capacity is 16 gallons, and if I had a full tank of gas, I could drive 320 miles before I ran out of gas, right? Would be how we could describe this to a friend. Awesome. What questions do you guys have about our, our two, our two F gallons in the tank? Awesome. So I want you to know that three, four, and five are all stamped eligible items, and they're going to follow this sort of same kind of template of interpreting, right? Which is the dependent versus the independent, getting points, doing the slope, right? And so on and so forth. However, now we're going to go ahead and switch to our homework and do one homework problem to remind you about our steps from the graphing calculator. So at this time, let's go ahead and go to our graphing calculator. On our graphing calculator, we'll go ahead and enter the data that gives the length and mass of vertex. Typically, right, typically, do my independent variable values, my x values, come from the first column or the second column when given tabular data? Which one are the x's? Margo? First. The first. And so everybody, let's take a minute and enter. Let's go ahead and enter these 
into our graphing calculator. So everybody remember where our, our stat menu was? So everybody second row, third button, stat. Edit. And let's clear out any existing data by highlighting list titles, pressing clear, and enter. I'm sorry, clear and then down arrow. And we'll go ahead and carefully enter our data. Take a minute and make sure that your data matches 1 1.92, 2.5316, 3.19, 3.614, 2.9017, 4.019, 5.3, 4.25, 6.16, 6.23. Awesome. So we'll go ahead and get our data. And then what we're going to do is we're going to make a, a scatter plot, right, by turning our plot one on. So where can we go to plot one again? Where was that? Where can we go to get our plot, our scatter plot on? Well, we could go ahead and do that with y equals, right? Second stat plot or y equals. And we want to make sure that we highlight plot one by up arrowing and turning on, turning on plot one by pressing enter. It should be highlighted if we want it on. So I would have to go up and up arrow and highlight it. And there I have it now highlighted. Are we good? Now, I'm not going to be able to make this picture unless I adjust my window so I can see the plot. What happens if you don't click plot one, then? If you forget it? It just won't make a scatter plot. Oh. I'm saying I want to make a scatter plot to see what it looks like and not do it by hand. Okay, so ready? So there we go. You can still get the equation. Absolutely, on the home screen you get your equation and you just don't get the picture. So let's go ahead and take a look at the graph. Now, if I do graph right now and I'm in the wrong window, it's only going to show me a portion. What window should I make? I should make a window that encapsulates all my data points min to max. And so what I'm going to do is manually set the window. I'm going to go ahead and choose a window that's less than 1.9 and greater than 6.3. So I'm going to go ahead and pick negative 2 up until 8. So I arbitrarily chose a little bit to the left of 1.9 and a little bit to the right of 6.3. So I want to get a nice picture of my scatter plot. What about my mass values, my y values? Well, I need to be less than 2 and greater than 63.8. So I'm going to go negative 10 to 80. Again, I'm just choosing these values based on my data so I can, I can get a good picture. All right, let's go ahead and see how that does. Hey, that's pretty good. I like it. So I can go ahead and nice. I made a picture. It's pretty sweet. That was awesome. You guys see how I did that? Scoots it right over there. Huh. All right. How do I get the equation? Well, we'll get to do our cool, cool commands now. We can do stat. Everybody do it. Stat. Calculate, right? We want to stack calculate. The fourth option is WinRig. Then we want to store it. So where do we store it? Remember, we do bars. If you have the 83, you don't have to. You just do the same buttons. Bars. Y bars. Function. Y1. And we'll store it automatically in our Y1 before pressing Enter again or Calculate Enter. And voila, the calculator spit out the values that I'll use for my equation. Write that down. Y equals negative 35.43x plus 15.13. Yes, Mr. What's that? 
Oh, because it went AX plus B. So 15, sorry, 15.13X. Thank you. Oh. Minus 35.43. Thank you. And a graph would show that the line doesn't do as good a job, right, with this relationship as it did yesterday, right? The last class did a better relationship. It turns out that a better model for this might be a power function, maybe a cubic function, because if we think about mass of my egg, is really in three dimensions. As that egg gets, gets longer, its mass, right, its mass or volume is kind of a, going to be a cubic in three dimension versus the single dimension x quantity. So I'm thinking a cubic might do a better job. In any case, we've got our graph, and that's pretty sweet. Now let's predict the mass of an egg that is 8 centimeters long. I could simply do trace, go to my y function by down arrowing, 8, enter, and it would jump on the graph and make a prediction 85.54. Or I could plug in 8 into my equation on my home screen. Right? I could plug in 8 into my equation on my home screen and simply do 15.13 times 8 minus 35.43. And what do we get? Uh, 85.47. So in both cases, about 85.47 grams. Does that seem reasonable? Yeah, it seems reasonable. As I get larger, I'm getting larger. So that would be over here. And there's my prediction. What questions do you have about the graphing calculator commands? So recall, our club work schedule puts us first hour at 10.03, which means you've got a nice chunk of time to get your stamps for 3F, 4F, and 5F. That was the non-calculator. Your homework is the status plot worksheet, which is calculator allowed. Use your graphic, just like we did now. What questions do you have about the rest of the hour? Okay, you may choose someone to work with so long as you're quiet and on task, and then come up to the front table when you're ready for stamps. I'll pause the recording here. So we don't have to do any of these? We don't have to grab them. Okay. You have to grab them, yeah. Yes. How do you get the... No, you still have to grab Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go ahead and take a look at our closure for today. So, suppose that the cost C in dollars of your afternoon at the amusement park is a function of the number of rides R you go on and is given by the equation C equals 2.75R plus 12.95. What I want you to do is connect those numbers in my equation to the physical context of the problem and then interpret the slope in the context of the problem complete with units and interpret the y-intercept in the context of the problem complete with units. I want you to go ahead and write down these responses and check with your partner. So go ahead and check with your partner and write down these responses and you're ready to share. And we'll go ahead and share in about a minute and a half. Okay, go ahead and share your interpretation with the class when I call on you for slope. Number one, let's interpret the slope in context. Barrett? Absolutely. The cost of your afternoon at the amusement park increases 
by 275 for every one more ride you go on. Perfect. So let's go ahead and write that. So the slope and context would be the cost of the afternoon. Increasing by $2.75 for each ride you go on. Lastly, the Y intercept. And what did you have for that? What did you have for your Y intercept? Aaron? The start cost. What do you mean by the start cost? Absolutely. So, like the cost of admission, the start cost to get in. Have a wonderful day and a great weekend, you guys. When zero rides are in. Turn your rulers in, please. Have a great weekend. Have fun.